Uh, before talking about my research, uh, let me briefly introduce my office. This is the laboratory where I'm working, Atmosphere and Ocean Research Institute, <coughs> or AORI, is on the Kashiwa campus of the University of Tokyo. And the staff consists of uh, scientists expertizing earth science, oceanography, marine chemistry, marine biology, and fishery science. The agenda of uh, today's symposium is exploring a unified view beyond complexity. Actually, I feel an affinity or empathy with this topic because both <coughs> atmosphere and ocean show quite complex dynamics and also uh, the marine ecosystem and organisms living there are representatives of complex systems. Today I will focus on the ecology of marine invertebrates and talk about what is the unsolved problems we should address uh, and how we should cope with difficulties uh, under the complexity. Currently, I'm working on the ecolog ecological study of planktonic larvae of marine vertebrates. Usually, planktonic larvae of marine vertebrates are quite minute, and the diameter is only one micrometer in this species. The ecological study of planktonic larvae, <coughs> larvae is held back in marine biology and less well understood. I believe that this delay is ascribable to some kind of complexity around the ecological properties of uh, planktonic larvae. The shells in this photo are all curries. The lava in the previous seat also belonged to curries. I mean that small planktonic larvae <coughs> finally grow up to snails with these beautiful shells. The word curry is a common name, and scientifically, they make the family Cypriidae, or Cypriidae in Latin pronunciation. The family Cypriidae comprises more than 200 species. All of them are widespread along the tropical and subtropical seas. Among them, genus Monetaria uh, is suitable for ecological study because they are found in intertidal zone. These six taxa belong to the genus Monetaria, uh, and I'm focusing on Monetaria annulus at present. This seed illustrates the life cycle of intertidal caries. An adult female <coughs> deposits an egg mass on the surface of substrates and each egg capsule contains hundreds of eggs, so more than 100,000 of individuals hatch out at once. Then free-swimming Belija larvae uh, have spent their pelagic life in the pelagic zone until settling to the bottom of the sea. And the Belija larvae equips a spiral shell at bath. <coughs> After settlement, curries experience the first metamorphosis and start to develop the juvenile shell uh, on the minute shell constructed during the planktonic stage. The growth of uh, juvenile shell continues until the end of the juvenile stage. And Curries keep thickening cows by coating the outer surface of the juvenile shell with calcareous materials during the cows building stage. After that, curries sexually mature 
and begin reproduction. <coughs> Can the gathering curry monetary annuals is distributed across uh, the Indo-Pacific region like this. And subspecies monetaria annus ovelata uh, is endemically found <coughs> in the French Polynesia. And these photos uh, monetaria annus shows collected from different localities. The top and middle specimens are both monetaria annus, but shell size is amazingly different. And the bottom one is uh, monetary annuals of velata uh, collected from French Polynesia. <coughs> and this subspecies has a unique shell shape such that the external calcification uniformly proceeds over the lateral part delimited from the central dorsal area. Okay. So curries show remarkable variation in shell size and shell shape. The variation itself has a long history of scientific study, but its ecological cause had been unclear. I wondered if the variation is caused by the difference of environmental conditions among localities. So let us see the scenery of habitats of monetary animals by comparing three different habitats. The first place is, oh, <coughs> first place is Okinawa. Okinawa is located in the subtropic zone and the most important locality of this species in Japan. Okinawa is close to the northern limit of reef building corals from a macroscopic viewpoint. <coughs> Okinawan coasts are made of the materials uh, coming from corals. One of the habitat of monetary animals is muddy or sandy coasts with limestone pebbles in Okinawa. And you can see carries and the pebbles during ebbs. This is particularly important in summer uh, because effective avoidance from heat directly affects their survivorship. Another type of habitat in Okinawa is a rocky shore like this. Th those rocks, these rocks are raised limestone, originally derived from dead corals. Carries live in small holes of these rocks. Okay, the next place is Hachijo Island of Japan. Hachijo is close to the northern limit of the distribution of this species, and possibly there is no permanent population in this island. But Hachijo is really important when we consider the larval ecology of this species because a strong northward warm current, Kuroshio, hits uh, this island. The, ecological fe so the geological feature of the coast is similar to those in Japanese main islands like Honshu and Kyushu. This obviously contrasts with the geology of Okinawa I showed in the previous seeds. The coast of Hachijo Island is mainly made of volcanic origin rocks. A mountain of this island is classified as an active volcano, and the rocks found in the coast were generated by previous eruptions. And various sizes of tidal pools emerged during ebbs. And Monetaria annulus is found on the back side of rocks. <coughs> and these individuals are juvenile ones. And this picture was taken in May, but I'm not sure whether these individuals 
are successfully overwintered or newly recruited after winter. I suppose that population in this island often get extinct in winter due to low temperatures. This is the reason why this island is important with respect to the relationship between population persistence and larval dispersal. Finally, I, I will show you the habitat located in the center, central part of the distribution of this species. In the last month, I visited Pompeii Island of Micronesia. <coughs> Geology of Pompeii Island is a typical barrier reef in the classification by Charles Darwin. There is a large lagoon between the main island and barrier reef. The seawater surrounding the main island is slightly cloudy because of the silt from the main island. In contrast, the seawater around the barrier reef shows perfect transparency, indicating strong oligotrophy. <coughs> Monetary annuals was found in the place close to bar barrier reef. This habitat kept submerged even during ebbs when I visited. There are so many limestone pebbles on the sandy floor, and the curries are found on the backside of the pebbles. <coughs> you might be aware that this place is quite colorless. All you can see is white cloud in the sky and gray limestone pebbles on the white coral sands. This is probably because substrate is not covered by algae or diatoms, so green or brown photosynthetic pigments are missing here. I suppose that nutrient concentration is too low to support their growth in this water. This environment is completely different from those in Hachijo and Okinawa I showed in the previous seeds. Looking at the three habitats across latitudes, it seems evident that the environmental conditions are different among populations for this species. I have studied the relationship between environments and shell morphology for about 20 years. But the topic I will talk about today is another question. That is, how often does migration occur across latitudes in this species? This is the Pacific-centered map illustrating major ocean currents. As you know, we have a strong north-flowing north warm current called the Kuroshio on the Pacific side of the Japanese archipelago. This current can be yeah. This uh, current uh, can be uh, traced back to the North Equatorial Current that flows east to west in the near equatorial zone. Accordingly, we may say that Micronesia is located at just an upper stream of the Kuroshio. <coughs> in this context, it is, it, is <coughs> it is natural to wonder if the persistence of Japanese populations heavily rely on the populations for, in, for example, Marshalls, Micronesia, Guam, Palau, or Philippines. This perspective is important when we consider the conservation of marine ecosystem around the Japanese archipelago because similar dynamics should occur in many other species as well. As I said, larval ecology of marine vertebrates is not well studied yet. This is, a, yeah, this is mainly because 
rubber ecology comes with serious technical difficulties. <coughs> One of the difficulties arises from the fact that larvae are quite small and the spatial scale that we have to think about is really global. Fortunately, we can benefit from the innovative development and improvement of recent years in analytical hardware. So I'm proceeding with several lines of approach with my colleagues. An example of hard hardware is EPMA. <coughs> Using this machine, we can quantify elemental composition of the shells constructed by planktonic larvae, and this information potentially makes possible to estimate temperature experienced by the larvae. And needless to say, uh, DNA sequencing techniques continue to achieve a significant progress uh, over the past several decades. I believe that genetic information is necessary to get a comprehensive understanding about larval migration across latitude. I have not enough time to speak today, so I will show you only the graphical results of rearing experiments of planktonic larvae. Actually, no existing protocol has been established for the rearing of caries larvae, and this is also a challenging task uh, by itself. Uh, rearing of larvae begins with collecting egg mass in the field, getting eggs attached to a po portable object uh, is really important to carry eggs to the laboratory. The timing of visiting the field is also important because the reproduction of caries is seasonal and also sensitive to lunar phase. <coughs> the egg mass uh, is kept at a constant temperature in the laboratory to wait for hatch. Newly hatched larvae are separately cultured to avoid mass mortality due to infection or a contamination of predatory microbes. I will show you some movies for this rearing trial. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is the inside of egg capsule and just before hatching. Larvae are already well developed and ready for swimming out. And <coughs> this is a larva just after hatching, actively swimming by beating cilia. And Yeah, he ha has two disc-shaped parts here, and these are called uh, velums. And cilia are lined along the outer edge of velums. And you can also see two eyes here. And this is an anterior view of the same lava. The diameter of uh, this individual is about 100 micrometer. And this is an individual several days after hatching. This individual is eating planktonic diatoms. And cilia are uh, used for collecting diatoms as well. And <coughs> after two months, shell size increased uh, to about 400 micrometer, and the number of velums increased from two to four, showing an elongated shape. And this is the maximum size I successfully reared in a couple of rearing tryouts, and all the individuals died out along the way. Actually, uh, actually lava rearing is a fight 
against mortality. This individual is eaten by predatory protists at the bottom of the rearing container. This is the result of contamination, but most of deaths are unaccountable. Large mortality, <coughs> large mortality occurs even using antibiotics. Okay, this is the map I already showed for the explanation of ocean currents. Please imagine that a particle of only 100 micrometer is drifted by currents on the surface of ocean. This project is really challenging because we have to consider the behaviors of the both minute particles and large scale fluid dynamics at the same time. Okay, this is a movie uh, download, downloaded from the website of NASA. You can see that ocean currents are not so simple to indicate by a single arrow on the map. Flow paths of currents are completely dynamic and always changing. A number of eddies, yeah, the number of eddies with various sizes keep coming and going along the mainstream. Dynamics of ocean current is a typical complex system by itself. And you, can, you can see the currents around the Japanese archipelago, so complex. Yeah, this movie is created by NASA and you can browse it on the web. What I want to emphasize here is that we need to pay attention to the global scale phenomenon to understand the behavior of microscale organisms. Okay, <coughs> I'd like to summarize the main message of my talk. In the first half of this talk, I showed environment is amazingly different among populations within the distribution of the focus species. This motivated me to study larval dispersal for a better understanding of the adaptation to heterogeneous environments by marine vertebrates. However, planktonic larvae of marine vertebrates are not well studied in ecology due to technical difficulties. I believe that these difficulties can be overcome by utilizing new technologies. Finally, I emphasize that it is particularly important to pay attention to the complexity that will repeatedly emerge from microscopic to macroscopic levels in this study. Okay, yeah, I'd like to acknowledge the people who worked with me on this project. Yeah, that's all, thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>